Okay, in part two of chapter 24, we're going to be looking at how electric currents uh, create magnetic fields. So what is the relationship between those? All right, and we'll also be looking at electromagnets. All right, so um, it was discovered uh, by Hans Orsted in the, uh, I think it was the seven, maybe it was the 1800s. Um, he discovered that a compass needle was deflected by a current carrying wire. So you've got a wire and you put current through it, and the needle of a compass that's lying nearby will actually be tilted up towards or away from it. But the current had to be flowing, right? It's not just a wire. It has to have moving charged particles. Now, um, so what's actually happening here is the current carrying wire is producing a magnetic field. That's how it affects the compass. So currents of electricity, create magnetism. And so um, if you have more current, of course, a stronger current is going to create a stronger magnetic field. And if you have a um, coil, then that can create an even stronger magnetic field. So make your wire into a coil and put current through it. Now, this creates what's called an electromagnet. And one of the big advantages of electromagnets is they can be switched on and they can be switched off. And they're very easy to make. And you can make them very, very strong, stronger than um, a normal magnetic material. OK, so here is a wire with has some current flowing through it. So I for current. And then what's happening is that you can see these compass needles are all lining up in a circle. Isn't that weird? They line up in a circle because the magnetic field that's being created is actually circular. And you can see over here real uh, filings, iron filings are lining up around this wire to create a magnetic field. Now, this is everywhere along the wire is this circular magnetic field is created. And this magnetic field does have a direction that depends on the current. If the current in this picture was upwards like this, so I was flowing upwards, then the magnetic field would be, if you were looking down the wire, that would be a counterclockwise direction. Okay, which in physics we uh, know this because we learn what are called the right hand rules when we're in physics class. So our thumb is the current, and the magnetic field lines are the curl of the hand. Okay, so anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so stick your thumb out wrap your fingers, and that's the direction of the magnetic field. So if the current goes downward, then it goes the opposite direction. Um, so it, there's no north and south. <laughs> Remember we were saying you have to have a north and a south? Well, there is a north and south direction in that the magnetic field lines are um, representing the way a compass would point, but there's no location for north and south. And as you get further away from the wire, the magnetic field will get weaker and weaker as you go out, right? But it exists far out around the wire. Now, we have lots of electric wires in our house. Do we notice compasses lining up with them and magnets being attracted to them and paper clips and stuff? No, we don't. But that's one reason that when we have a power cord uh, to an object, we usually have them fastened together, the current going out and the current coming back in the circuit. Those two pieces of, of um, wire are bound together. And that way their magnetic fields cancel out. So we don't have random magnetic fields running around because we have our lamp plugged in. Okay, so that's one reason that the, the, they are bound together. 
Okay, now, um, like I said, as if you make a coil, then what happens is that the magnetic field, um, which is wrapped around each of these wires, okay, so here it's in a circle, what will happen is they will meet in the center, and you will get a stronger magnetic field in the center of this coil of wire. So here you see the magnetic field circular around a straight wire. But as you make a loop, then what happens is the magnetic field starts to curve, right, and go kind of straight in there and get strong in the center. And on the outside, it's weaker. And then we see how if we have many, many loops, we basically get a very strong magnetic field on the inside, but it's very, very weak on the outside. Notice these are not lined up on the outside. They've canceled out. So the magnetism is inside that coil of wire, and that makes a strong electromagnet. And the more coils that you have, the stronger the magnetic field. Also, the higher the current, of course, the stronger the magnetic field. Okay, so electromagnets are really useful. They're everywhere. Did you use one today? Probably. Did you lock your car door and go slick, click, hear that click, click sound? There's your electromagnet. Um, used to be doorbells had electromagnets. So when you would press the doorbell, electricity would flow through a coil. It would pull a rod, and that rod would hit the bell, and it would go ding. And then your finger would go off the bell, and that would, the rod would be pulled back by a spring, and it would go dong on its other plate. So that was the original ding-dong doorbells, which most people have replaced by electronic ones that uh, are not nearly as much fun. Okay, so um, so anyway, so electromagnets are everywhere, and they are terribly useful for picking up um, objects of metal. And um, you can make them even stronger by wrapping the coil around a piece of iron. So we've got an iron rod here. And then this um, iron is usually labeled as soft because you need, so what happens inside the iron is you get the dipoles lined up in it. So that's why it makes a stronger magnetic field. So the dipoles are all start to get lined up in here. And so because there's a magnetic field coming through. So then it creates a secondary magnetic force. So you get a stronger magnet. And uh, But if you switch the current direction, you need to uh, change the direction. You can do that with an electromagnet, or you need to turn it off. You don't want residual magnetism. You want to just have it off. So it's soft because those, um, those domains can be lined up and then uh, unlined up very easily. So quickly magnetized and unmagnetized. So you've probably seen pictures, okay, of this is a giant electromagnet picking up iron at a scrapyard. Usually they just use jawed things nowadays. They don't really use the big electromagnets so much. Um, this is the kind you could buy. So here's an electromagnet. You could get this through your hardware store. It's a double coil, makes it twice as strong. Um, you may remember in um, Iron Man, right, his coil that was supposed to keep the bits of iron from going into his chest, right, that was an electromagnet, so he had to run it by a car battery or his super fantastic uh, generator. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the coil's crucial, so there's a point in the in the movie where his coil is removed and he instantly starts feeling bad which doesn't make any sense because it's not like those iron pieces are instantly going to go the other direction towards his heart um anyway uh, so uh this is a giant coil of uh, which uh is wrapped many times um at fermilab and uh, to produce a very strong magnetic field and here are some other so that one's about as big as, you know, you could stand in here, probably. 
And these are giant magnets, um, electromagnets with superconducting wires. Um, they're copper wires, but they're kept very, very cold. So they become superconducting. And uh, so these uh, Fermilab had um, superconducting magnets when it ran at really high energies. And then it built some to go to CERN to the new Hadron Collider. So which Fermilab is a participant in that too. Um, so let me show you an electromagnet demonstration. So let's take it over here. Got my wires all angle here. Let's see if I can pin this. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, so um in this box, we have this is a coil of wire, and I'm going to power it with a D battery. But first of all, let's check and make sure it's not magnetic right now. Okay, so here's an iron plate, which is not attracted to it at all. Okay, so what we're going to do though, you can't see the coil, it's covered up. I'm going to put the battery in. Okay, nothing spectacular happening. Uh, let's see what happens if I bring a paper clip near it. Yep, paper clip sticks. And let's try this iron plate. Sticks. Okay, and in fact this iron plate um, can now hold, whoops, if it's, if what it can do is it can actually hold, um, this can hold up to like 50 pounds. Uh, actually, it can hold up, it's the one that can hold up to 200. Um, anyway, so that one D cell battery is creating enough current that this is very hard to get apart except to battery out usually. Okay, so that's the easiest way to get it apart again. So if I take out the battery, then plates come apart. Okay, so anyway, that's the idea with an electromagnet. The coil of wire, run some electricity through it, and now it's a magnet. All right, let's go back. Now, um, what are the future ways perhaps of transportation is a mag plane a magnetically levitated vehicle. And right now, usually the trains that you hear about that are super fast, they're not maglev trains. There are some of them, uh, but they usually are not a full um, useful train. Anyway, um, so, but the idea is that you can use magnets to pick this train up. So, um, so the train has arms that are wrapped around the um, this center frame. That's the track. And what happens is that there are actually magnets that are oppositely polarized, two electromagnets, and they're attracted to each other. And so what happens is that that lifts the train off the platform up a few inches and then it has other magnets which help to guide it and push it down the track. And so it runs down the track uh, floating on magnetism. And the idea is that um, it can't derail. If it runs out of power, it just would settle back to the track. And you can maybe achieve huge speeds, especially if it's in a vacuum. So this is an idea for a vacuum one under the sea, maybe between Japan and China or somewhere like that. Um, and the train could travel 2,000 
miles per hour if it's in a vacuum. And this has air in these maintenance shafts, so um, that air could flood in if there's ever an incident. So, anyway, but that's the idea, that we could have maglev trains. Now, a galvanometer is discussed in your book, and galvanometers are the basis for ammeters and voltmeters. So ammeters measure amps of current, voltmeters measure voltage, and these are the old needle-style ones. And uh, so like you would see in the old days, but they're still going to be useful, okay? Um, but the idea is that what happens is that um, a small amount of current goes through a coil of wire here, that's wrapped around a soft iron core. And so when that current goes through there, it makes that into an electromagnet. But there are permanent magnets, a north on one side and the south on the other side of this horseshoe magnet. So what happens is you're creating an electromagnet that has a north of its own. And that north will be repelled from the other north. And the other end of it will be a south. And that south will be repelled from the south. So what happens is the needle is attached to the um, coil, and so the needle moves over, right, as it's repelled. And um, so you could have it start in the zero position and be attracted or repelled, but yeah, that's how the needle, the dial types worked, okay? It's by a little electromagnet in there that's very sensitive. Okay, and that's the end of part two. So we'll be going on to part three.